All right, we are going to begin, and uh, here's the deal. Um, I'll, I'll do it by a show of hands. Who would like to exit the room and preach first? Because uh, what's going to happen is Pastor Henry's going to give the same lecture twice, and so you'll see you'll, nobody's going to miss anything. But um, some will go to preach first, and then we'll switch. And um, so the, the simple question is, who would like to go first? See if I... Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the hands up. You'll go with me, and those, uh, everyone else, stay here. You'll hear Pastor, but not yet, not yet. We're gonna do that in just a second. <laughs> First, we're gonna open in prayer. Okay, let's do that. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity right now to once again uh, learn and practice the craft of communicating. But Father, we don't for a second think that it's going to be purely about human effort. We recognize it is the infusion of your Holy Spirit into what we say. And we may be speaking and preaching to each other today, but that doesn't change the fact that you may say something that stirs our hearts that one of us needs to hear. So I pray that we will preach with that sense of burden, with that sense of passion that comes from somebody with something on their heart that they want to share in the name of Jesus, for his glorification. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so a a couple words in preparation. Um, For those who are going to be going to preach, if you're not going to be preaching at that moment, you're going to be looking at an evaluation form. You don't, don't feel obligated that you have to fill out everything on this form. There's, you know, there's lots of questions and it's a five minute sermon. However, fill out something. Put the name on the top of who's preaching, but then after that is done, um, after we've heard all seven people, um, then we're all going to divide up what you wrote and give it to that person. And, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Once you receive it, don't look at it until the whole class is done. Otherwise, when Pastor Henry's given his lecture, it's going to be like, who said I had this? You know, or you know, you're, you'll be going um, now. You, in terms of who uh, reviewed it, you can put your name on the bottom and say, "This is me." If you want to ask a follow-up question, you can, but you don't have to. But on the other hand, keep in mind, reviews are important, and they stick with us. I think it was about three months ago I met with Pastor Leslie, and I said. Pastor Leslie, your ability to exegete the scripture has just grown so well. And your ability to now preach without notes is really cool. I do think you have a bit of a preacher's voice. And she's like, preacher's voice? What do you mean by that? So what I mean is you sound different when you're preaching than when I'm talking to you like right now. That's all I mean. It's, it's like there's a distinctive voice in that process. And so just this week, she made reference, after all, I have a preacher's voice. Mm-hmm. Now, what, she, what I'm my pointing is, is that we always remember anything bad that was said to us. And now here is the truth of preaching and getting evaluated. The more you're evaluated, the less it matters to you. I mean, somebody came up to me at the congregational meeting this past Sunday night. Hey, Steve, Steve, come here. Your flies down. Thank you. He just gave me a gift. I don't want to be up there with my fly down. And so when they tell me something, there was, but sometimes it's serious. After the first sermon, one time Pastor Jim caught me saying something that could be racially offensive. Now, I don't want to do that. It was something I, I, I just thought it was okay. But as soon as he said it to me, I was like, thank you, Pastor Jim. I got two more sermons that I can fix and not have that problem. Simply put, when you get a critique, um, it could be somebody notices you have a a, a nervous twitch. You you go like this. You know, it's something, something that's going on. Even though it's weird and awkward, if somebody tells you that, you have received a gift, but keep this in mind. Somebody's going to be handing you an evaluation form too. So write anything you write to be encouraging, edifying, and helpful. But 
if it's purely sugar-coated, you're doing everyone a disservice. I, I came from a church in Illinois that every Monday we had a staff meeting and uh, the pastor would say, how did the service go? And we gushed every day on how it was a wonderful service and you gave a wonderful sermon. And I said, note to self, if I have a chance to be a senior pastor, I want truth. I don't want everyone to tell me in a circle how wonderful I am. And, you know, so I started that. Sometimes I didn't like it. Pastor Steve, that illustration you gave about fruit of the spirit, it looked like you were having a bowel movement on the stage. I'm like, did I just hear you say that to me? And I'm like, maybe there's a middle road between not telling anything and telling it all, you know, as to what would be simply put, critiques are good. So before we se separate, I want to, you had homework this weekend. Anyone care to say something you observed in Sunday's message? And one of the preachers, in fairness, is right here. So if Pastor Henry was in the service that you were at, he's here. I want to hear it. And he's, he's open to hear it. Of, of course, he's, he's pretty good at what he does. So if you remember, the, the passage was Esther chapter 4. I mean, this is the pastor handed down from heaven for such a time as this. You know, it's like the kind of sermon topic that pastors love. Any review of anything you heard this weekend? And speak loud for everyone. So Antonio? Uh, yeah, it was Pastor Henry uh, Sunday uh, here in Sayotes. So Pastor Henry, yes, sir. it's in love. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Pastor Henry had three points in his message that Esther humbled herself before God, identified herself, with God and presented herself to God. Uh, point one was clear, point two and three, I thought were a little bit, bit disconnected. Uh, Good for you, Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So, so point two, identifying herself with God, she identified herself with the Jewish people, which is my, what many Jewish people do today, but that doesn't mean that they identi identify themselves with God and presented herself to God, I, I, I thought the picture of putting the dev next to Jesus uh, was a little bit forced. Uh, uh, she said, if I die, I die, but uh, I, 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 I didn't see that conscious uh, suffering death that Jesus had in front of him. I'm going to hold off here because I want to give others an opportunity to speak too. But what he just said, just to, to reiterate, he thought the second point could have been a little queerer, and he thought the connection or juxtaposition between Esther and Jesus made in the end was maybe a little forced. Now, this is, this is actually good stuff, but here's what a good critique relationship is. So let's say Henry and you were having a conversation. It might be a follow-up question like, Antonio, how do you think the second point might have been a little queerer? You know, and, and to have an idea as to what that would be. And then when it comes to the, uh, the, the Jesus connection, I can tell you that at the preacher's meeting when we were talking about it, we saw the connection between Esther and Jesus is, is pretty strong, except Esther gets a reprieve, Jesus willingly goes all the way to the cross. And so I, my guess is if Henry was interacting with you, he would kind of push back on that little bit and push back is good. Just because somebody is critiquing your message does not mean they're right. It just means you're getting a different perspective. And so you make an assessment. Somebody comes to me after a service and says, again, Pastor Jim is usually good at this. He says, Steve, your illustrations were good, but after point two, you gave two illustrations. They're both okay, but did you need to? I thought your illustrations took on a life of their own. So after I hear that, I make a decision. Am I going to give those two illustrations again? Sometimes I say, yeah, I will. I watched the faces in the crowd, and I saw the smiles. I saw the such and such. Granted, as a preacher, I like that. You know, I like seeing the smiles. And so I might decide, yeah, I'm going to do them again. Other times... I hear Jim say that or, or someone else, and I think, Jim, thank you. I, you know, I thought the same thing, 
and you pushed me over the edge. I am getting rid of one of those illustrations. Um, so that's good. So the whole point of feedback, it doesn't mean they're right. It means that they have insight that you can deal with and wrestle with. Someone else, uh, feedback from Sunday. I will, Henry, it was the best sermon I ever heard. No, just kidding. Um, one thing I noticed- By the way, she works for Henry. <laughs> <laughs> just wanna applaud. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Jamie. One other one, and then we're going to wrap up with this section. Uh, I went to Island Christian Church, so I didn't go, but I heard it. And was Chris preaching on Sunday? Preached on okay. Sunday. And it was funny that I listened to your message the Sunday before on Esther, and his message was on Esther, too. Oh, was it really? Yeah, and it had a little different take on uh, Mordecai, whether he should bow or not bow. You know, it was a little right. different. So, but, I mean, the message I, I thought was great, and it was very timely. And... Uh, my only critique, what I would say that I would add to that, and it's something I'm learning in this class, the idea that he didn't tie Christ to it. I mean, the message had a great point and conviction, but there was no tying in Christ, like, you know, closing it up. So other than that, I mean, I thought it was a powerful message. But, you know, as I'm reading the books that he's giving me to read, I realize that Frank. Christ should be in there. Frank, thank you for saying that. And, and by the way, that is something that and Pastor Henry's here, and I work for him too, so I'm going to you know, ingratiate a little bit. But what, one thing Pastor Henry really encourages us as pastors, when we fill out a preparation sheet for our sermon, the last question is, how does the gospel interact with this passage? Now, we have heard, Tim Keller will tell you, others will tell you, particularly out of context book will tell you, if you're trying to shoehorn Christ into some place that it, this text does not engage in, be careful, be wise. You want to be a good exegete of Scripture. But there's not a Scripture in the Bible that you can't make a connection in some respects to the Gospel. It's not that you're trying to force it into the passage, but you can make comparative. This reminds us of the Gospel. It is a contrast of the gospel. It is, in other words, you look at it. Again, that question I asked you, if this could be taught on, on Oprah or at any synagogue, we're, we're missing something. And so good observation, Frank, to say that. Okay, uh, one final thing. I mentioned this before for those of you who are uh, early. Um, the sign-up sheet for the 15-minute message is uh, with Jenny. And um, there are going to be times to preach a 15-minute message either before the class, between 9 and 10, or after the class, between 10 and, uh, excuse me, 12 and 1. So keep that in mind. You can put your name there. And here's the final thing. You get to pick your passage. I've decided in my graciousness and love and my compassion, you get to pick your passage. But here's the deal there's wisdom associated with that. If you decide, I think I'll preach the book of Esther, you're making a mistake. In other words, pick, your, this is a 15 minute message, pick a passage that you maybe resonates with you, but make sure it's of reasonable length so that you can do it justice in 15 minutes. If you're 16 minutes, I'm cool. 17 minutes, I'm cool, but I now have a asterisk next to your name. If you're 13 minutes, I'm fine. If you're seven minutes, okay, you went far too short. The simple point is, if, you're, if, if one of my 15-minute messages is 25, 30 minutes, that blows it for everyone else. We only have a little time slot. So if I am having to say, um, Stephen, I appreciate the 19 minutes you've given us, but you're going to end your message without a conclusion right now because we need the time. Uh, do you get my point? In other words, be wise. And by the way, that's actually part of preaching. 
is that you know you have time. And if you go, particularly in a multi-service environment, you're starting to hit your next service and you're doing a disservice to the greater Sunday morning experience. People are starting to look at their watch. They're wondering, you know, what's going on? The worship leader's thinking, do I need to cut this last song? All this stuff starts falling apart. And the truth is the Holy Spirit is pretty cool. He can say something succinct. It doesn't need an hour and a half for the Holy Spirit to say what he wants to say. So keep that in mind. It's not a more sanctified message if you're extra verbose. Okay, so here's what we're doing. Those who raise their hand, come with me to the sanctuary. And if you didn't raise your hand like you didn't, Joshua, don't worry, you're right here. You're going to hear a lecture from Pastor Henry. And um, then we're going to switch. And if you guys finish before we're back, then just go on break time. And uh, we'll be back and then we'll start. Okay, here we go. To the sanctuary. Good to see you, I know. I feel like I talk with you all the time, but <laughs> I haven't seen you. So what's this being recorded here? Is this for online? Are we like streaming on Facebook and stuff like this? Or uh, it's just he's just saving it for archive? All right, cool. I hope I printed enough. If not, I'll print some more of these notes. Pastor Steve said I could talk about anything I wanted, really. And he said, talk about the thing that you feel like you do well. And... No, 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 no. And, and, and so what I really wanted to do, guys, by the way, I'm just so excited you're taking this class. I think it's awesome. And um, I really wish I could hear all you delivering your sermons. Um, maybe you'll come back another day to do that, your 15 minute ones. I really love this. Um, Pastor Steve kind of gave me the chance to be able to speak on anything, and I wanted to talk to you not so much about the thing I do well, but the things I think really are almost like disproportionately important in the sermon process. The things that I think maybe make the biggest difference. And so I want to talk to you about three things. I hope I have time to cover each. In fact, I think that clock works, right? So I'll keep an eye on that. I'm calling it the takeoff, the landing, and the freedom of flying when you know the way. Uh, think of a pilot taking off, landing, and then nobody wants to get in a plane when a pilot doesn't really know where he's going, right? And as a preacher, you know there's freedom when you're flying and you know the way. So I want to talk a little bit about the takeoff, which is the language I'm using for your introductions. I think the introduction is like its weighted importance for the time that you give it is, is it's remarkable. It's so significant. We know this. You guys have talked about this already, how quickly someone decides whether or not they're going to listen to you. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to have a good introduction that grabs the interest of the hearer, that raises the tension, that grabs their attention, that piques their interest. Within the first few moments, have you guys talked about this? Within the first few moments, people will decide no, not yet. whether or not they think you know what you're talking about, whether or not they think you're knowledgeable on the subject, whether or not they think this is going to be a long half hour or an enjoyable one, challenging one, or uncomfortable one. They, they determine right away. You've probably already done it with me. It's going to be a good lecture or a bad lecture. Where's Pastor Steve? I wish he was back here, you know? <laughs> but that happens in the introduction. I think, of the, I think of preaching like eating, or like receiving a sermon like eating, right? Um, we put food on the table. That's what we do every Sunday. It's not a TED Talk, right? It's not an inspiring motivational lecture. No, no, no. We're feeding God's people God's word. We put food on the table. I don't know about you, 
I'll drive for good food. You tell me I got to go to Queens to get the best, you know, sandwich. I'll go, I'll go to Cherry Valley Deli in Whitestone. I'll go do it. I'll do that because I know like they put gravy on top. Like I'll, I'll drive for good food, you know? So people will drive for good food. And I feel that way about preaching. Like I, I used to go when I was younger into the city to hear Tim Keller. I was 17 years old to hear Tim Keller at Hunter. But it was like you drive for good food. So the introduction in a sermon, it's like your appetizer. What's the appetite to prepare people for the main course. You sort of like get, get them ready for what's about to come. It creates a hunger for the food that's going to follow. A good sermon introduction can do the same thing. It can stimulate a hunger for the Word of God. So we want to sort of raise interest, tension, but we also want to foster a hunger. That's the intro. I want to talk a little bit about the conclusion. I won't spend as much time on that. But here's what I want to say. An effective sermon doesn't just end it lands. We've all been on planes when the plane is like circling the airport. And <laughs> we've all sat in sermons when it feels like the preacher is doing the same thing, right? A good sermon lands. It's not that you just stop talking. It's that you've actually brought people to a destination and you've landed the plane. Okay. A great conclusion can make a good sermon even better. A poor conclusion can cast a cloud over an otherwise clear message where the introduction sets out to capture the interest of the listener, a conclusion seeks to secure the heart of the listener towards response to what God has said through the sermon. So we want to take off well, we want to land well, but we also want to fly well. And what I, would, what I want to invite you to is to consider some of the advantages of preaching without notes. Okay, That's where I'll end my time. I'm largely using my notes now, but if you notice when I preach, like Antonio on Sunday or when you guys saw me preach on Sunday, I never preach with notes. I preach without notes. And there's several reasons for that. Pastor Steve preaches without notes. Pastor Leslie is trying to grow in that area, and she's beginning to preach without notes. And it's one of those areas that we're inviting our preachers, and I want to invite you to consider as you start developing as a preacher. I went to Gordon-Conwell Seminary. My professor was Haddon Robinson. Haddon Robinson, sort of, he wrote the book on preaching. And his big thing, he's a big advocate of preaching without notes. We could not preach our sermons in class in front of him with anything in front of us. And I've found the value. I'm a relational person. And when I have this standing in front of me, in between me and you, I feel like now I've got a barrier. I'd rather be sitting across the table, Keisha, and just talking to you just like this. There's also something where eye contact can't be maintained because I'm coming down here and I'm looking up here and I'm coming down here and I'm coming up here. Versus, I mean, here's the thing. You can't look at your notes and your listeners at the same time. So I can come right over to you, Antonio, and I just can maintain eye contact with you the entire time. And I can see how you're receiving the information. I can feel the room. Do you see the difference? When I'm standing back here and I'm looking down versus when I'm fully, this is out. And we're just fully engaged. So I, I want to give you some tips. I, I want to I make a case for preaching without notes. And I want to give you some tips because it's not memorization. I don't want to give you that like you have to memorize a whole manuscript. No, no, no. It's not memorization. It's internalization. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So those are the three things I want to do. My three points for today. Takeoff, landing, and the freedom of flying when you know the way. Okay. Introduction. Uh, when the first, within the first seven seconds of meeting, people say, people begin to form opinions about one another. The same thing happens with sermons. It doesn't take long for people to form an impression about whether the preacher in the sermon is about to be delivered. The impression you form in the first few moments determines whether listeners will lean in and be eager to listen to what follows. So I want to say a good introduction does two things. Number one, it's going to indirectly relate the listeners to the speaker, right? It's going to relate the listeners to you. You're going to be building a bridge and forming an impression with the people that are listening to you right away. So a good introduction is going to connect people to you personally. Remember, the Bible is written, right? God's Word is written. It's God's Word. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it comes through the personality of the human authors, Preaching is not very different. It's God's word to his people, but it gets carried and embodied through your unique 
personality. And in the first few moments, people are going to start to feel like they're connecting with you, like they're getting to know you, they're understanding you, and they're, and they're going to decide if they want to listen to you. If you're likable, knowledgeable, authentic, if you're real, if you're sincere, if you believe the thing you're saying, or if it's just a script, if you're prepared, or if you're not, like immediately, people are going to start making those judgments and decide right away. So they're going to decide if you're the kind of person they want to listen to very early, very early in your message. So they're going to relate to you. But the second thing the introduction does, and I think the more important thing, is it's going to build a bridge, not just between you and your listeners, but a bridge between uh, your introduction and what you're about to say and the text and the scripture and the sermon. Okay. Okay, a good introduction is going to compel listeners directly by relating the listeners to the scripture and the main idea of the sermon. A good introduction is like a bridge. It's going to connect people to the sermon or to the scripture or to the subject matter or to what's going on in the life of the listener. Right? I'll give you an example from this Sunday. We talked about Esther's key moment for such a time as this defining moment. There was this language in the Lord of the Rings where Tolkien, who's writing from a Christian framework, talks about Frodo having this been brought to this defining moment. He kind of sounds like Mordecai, Gandalf does, when he says those words. So I opened with an introduction about the Lord of the Rings. It's familiar, it's a point of contact, it's a cultural reference. I tell a story, I show an image, I read the quote. And then I am doing that, and people are getting to know me a little bit, right? Because I said something in the service where I was like, I've not read the book, I've watched the movie. Just full, full disclosure, I've not done that, right? But it's like, so people understand, like, okay, he's, be, he's, not, he's not the one reading, but he'll watch the movie, and he, he enjoyed it. Like, he's not a total Lord of the Rings nut, but he's interested. Um, but if I was a total Lord of the Rings nut, I can get into that. I'm a Lord of the Rings junkie, or you just, wh whoever you are, wh whatever the thing is. But I used it really as an opportunity not for people to get to know me, but for people to see a cultural connection and bridge to the text. Same thing that we saw there is happening here, okay? So I'm trying to build a bridge into the text. So how do you build a good introduction? I wanna give you some, some keys for, for introductions, okay? For introducing great introductions. I think I have a typo there. Okay, number one, to write a good introduction, you gotta be clear on the main idea of the sermon. You got to know what the text says and what it is you're trying to say about the text. Okay, the three points that Antonio mentioned from my sermon this week, they were all subpoints to my overarching point, my overarching idea that Esther is in a place where she's going to choose whether or not she's going to step up or shrink back. Frodo felt that, Esther felt that. And she decided to step up. So I had this main thought that she's not going to shrink back, but she's going to step up into what God has for her in this defining moment. That was my central thought. And all those other points were sort of subpoints reinforcing this main idea. Well, how does she step up? Well, she steps up in these variety of ways. So that's how that was structured. But I can't really build an introduction unless I understand the main thrust. So what is the main point of the sermon? And what is the big idea that you're after, okay? You cannot introduce an ill-defined or a vague concept. What is your sermon about? What does the text say? What are you in trying to convey to your listeners? And how can you do that? I'll give you an example for something I'm working on right now. Next week I'm preaching. The text is Esther, uh, I don't know, five something to six something. But one of the interesting things about Esther, it's written in a chiasm. A chiasm is an old literary structure, or they use it today still, where you sort of like, I don't, I don't want to get into the whole chiasm form, but basically the thing at the center of a chiasm is normally the main point of the author. Esther 6.1, that verse is the central part of the entire structure of the whole book pretty remarkable. Commentators note this. This is like the central idea of the whole book. What is Esther 6.1? It's the verse that says that the king couldn't sleep. Wow. Wow. The king couldn't sleep and he woke up at night. So I'm preparing for the sermon. We're talking about 
this text. I'm looking at the focus of the text. And the focus of the text is the fact that the king can't sleep. Okay. So I'm thinking about what is the main thrust of this text. And I think it has to do with the sovereignty of God. The king's not in control. God's in control. It's God waking up the king in his sleep. The king's sleeping in his bed. God's working, right? And it's the fact that the king can't sleep, that God wakes him up to bring him to this whole thing. God's the active agent, not Xerxes, right? So it's this whole sovereignty of God piece that's happening there. So anyway, I'm playing with this idea of an illustration of a time when I couldn't sleep. I was living in Boston, and I remember one night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I I usually don't do that. I usually sleep through, but it's like 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. And I'm really thirsty, like parched. And all I can think about is orange juice. Like, I like orange juice. I like a lot of pulp in my orange juice. Uh, a lot more, there's m- more pulp the better, right? So I'm, I'm, I wake up and I'm really thirsty. Our bedroom's on the second floor. I walk down the stairs and we walked into the kitchen. There was a little button light. I could pop it on and it lit up the whole kitchen. I pop on the light. I remember I open up the fridge, I pull out a thing of orange juice, I shake it, and I literally, I drank it right from the carton, okay? So don't tell my wife. And I drank it right from the carton, and then I go, and I put it back, and boom, and I shut off the light, and I go back up the stairs. Now, our kitchen sat right next to our, our driveway, okay? So I woke up very early in the morning. I had a job that I worked in a kitchen. I had to be up at 5.30. I had to leave for work, I think, at 5.30. So I get out of, up a few hours later. I walk out through the kitchen. I'm dressed. I go out to my Jeep. And I see my Jeep car door is open. Open. I walk, I'm like, what is, did I leave my door open? I look inside my Jeep and my center console is lifted up and my papers are everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, was someone trying to break into my car? Like what, what happened? And I start looking around and I realized I left my wallet in my Jeep that night and I look down and it's still in my cup holder with those papers that were come out over it so now it's like 5 30 in the morning I haven't had enough coffee but I'm trying to process what happened the night before like what's going on and then I remembered Mm. I woke up in the middle of the night Mm. I had to have orange juice I walked down the stairs I put on the light maybe someone was breaking into my car at the exact moment God woke me up and I put on the light and it scared them away I couldn't sleep. God woke me up. And God provided protection for my Jeep. Now, that's a silly example. I don't know if I'll use it or not. But getting into the text, I started to realize the central point of the passage was the king couldn't sleep. So I started to think either in my life or in history or in stories or in movies, examples when this may have happened. And that sort of brought me to this bridge of an introduction. That introduction does a couple things. It lets people know some things about me. I used to live in Boston. I like orange juice. I drink it right out of the container. I have a Jeep. All sorts of things that could relate me to people in the audience who don't know me. But more importantly, it's a bridge to the text. So you have to be clear on the big idea. That's number one. What's the thing you're trying to convey? And how can you take that to be able to form an introduction? Number two, develop interest. People give their attention, we know this, to what they perceive is interesting or important or relevant to them. So develop interest by raising tension or surfacing a need. You could start your sermon this way. Last week, we were in Isaiah chapter 44. Today, we're in Isaiah chapter 55. Rate that introduction on a scale of 1 to 10. Right? You can do that. And there may be some people in the church that are like, yes, Isaiah 55. Let's go. You know, like they just can't wait. Or how well do you do when you face trials in your life? When the unexpected comes and the thing you least desired enters in, how well do you do that? What do you do with that? How rate it on a one to ten? Four, five? It's getting better, right? Mm-hmm. Peak in interest, raise attention. Today we're going to talk about pride. 
want to open your Bibles to da 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 da, da. Okay? G.K. Chesterton said if he had but one sermon to preach, he would preach it on the subject of pride. C.S. Lewis said pride is the great sin. It's one of the seven deadly sins. It's a sin that God says he actively opposes, hates, opposes. It's a sin that turns an angel into a devil. As we look at our scripture today, we're going to see a sin that exists in each and every one of our hearts. A little better, right? It doesn't take long. And honestly, like if you go on your introduction for too long, I'm checking out. I'm looking, I'm thinking, where's the food? Give me the food. Where's the meat today? Where's my portion? You know, you don't want to spend 10 minutes on your introduction. I usually keep my introduction around 250 to, to 400 words. You know, it's, it's under five minutes, usually my introduction, because I want to get to the text. But it's my opportunity to pique interest, to raise tension, to spark some connection with the people and bring them into the word that we're about to drop. Okay. Wet their appetite. Uh, write your introduction and write it well. I want to encourage you to do this. Write your introduction and write it well. The wording of your introduction should be eloquent, striking, specific, and direct. Effective first sentences could be paradoxical statements or rhetorical questions. Have you ever felt like God was far away? Have you ever felt as though God was calling you to do the thing you just knew you couldn't do? I remember one time in my life when I was, you see what I'm saying? You just like something, spark it, get there, okay? Yes, ma'am. Can I leave the room start writing mine's over? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you're okay. Yeah, no, I really wish it went first. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny. Amazing. You know how you guys feel right now, by the way? This is how like we feel every Sunday morning when you say hi to us. You're like, hey, how you doing? And we're like, I'm good, I'm good, but I'm thinking about something else. You know what I'm saying? That's what's going on. <laughs> Tell me, what are you going to say? Go ahead, Dan. No, you're fine. You're fine. No, it's not that. It's just that what you're saying, it really just causes us yeah. to wonder where we go wrong. Yeah. So we're learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Already. Yeah. In a five-minute sermon, yeah. you're spending 20 seconds on your introduction, 30 seconds. You're not spending a lot. Today, I want to speak with you about pride and the control it has in my life and how I know God wants to free you from it in your life. Boom. It's a sentence or two for your, your time frame. But something that's sharp, that's direct, that's cutting, that's going to sort of raise the thing to the surface. What were you going to say, Dan? No, I was going to ask a question. If you're, yeah. if you're committed to your intro, but you're, you're two minutes in and you see the room is elsewhere, yeah. do you change on the fly? Or you kind of just so this goes back to the preaching without notes. Because you can. Yeah. I like, I like having the freedom of being able to read the room and saying, you know what, this point's not dropping. Or this point is landing. Let me stay here longer. Yeah. Yeah. You can feel people in that. Yeah. You want to write your introduction. You want to write it well. By the way, I gave you a, a sample introduction at the bottom of this. It was a sermon I gave a couple years ago on pride. And I started with the story of the Titanic. Um, she was the largest and most luxurious ship in the world. No expense was spared in her construction. She had opulent staterooms, luxurious dining rooms, smoking rooms with ornate ceilings, magnificent candelabra, an elegant grand staircase. She had elevators, libraries, a swimming pool, a Turkish bath, a gymnasium, etc., 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 right? In fact, when she left Southampton, England, on her maiden voyage, one of the deckhands was asked whether the ship was really unsinkable. And her builders, uh, and they boastfully replied, God himself couldn't sink this ship. The Titanic seemed invincible and vulnerable. People took great pride, put tremendous trust in the ship. That's why when the captain received half a dozen warnings from other ships of drifting ice in the area, he ignored them. That's why they left the port in Southampton with half the number of lifeboats that they needed. For the passengers on board. That's why when they saw glaciers, he said, full steam ahead. Right? And that's why on April 15th, 1912, the unsinkable ship sank. And I make a point. It wasn't 
an iceberg that sunk the Titanic. It was an attitude, a mindset of arrogance, self-righteousness, of pride. Maybe you like history, maybe you don't. I love history. So whenever anyone gets into a story about history, that's why you'll see that come through in my sermons, just because I love that stuff. But bring in the thing that, again, you're going to come through your introduction. You want people to connect to you and then to what you're talking about. So n- number four, match the mood of your introduction with the mood of your sermon. This is really important. Uh, if you're preaching on Good Friday, don't begin with a joke. Okay? Think of the mood. <laughs> Talking about the death of Jesus tonight. Well, I'm not going to begin with a, a, a little crack, you know? The mood of your introduction should match the mood of your sermon. Two weeks ago, I was preaching on Esther chapter 3. I was in Westbury, and we were talking about uh, the edict that was going out to annihilate all of the Jewish people. It's the darkest moment in the entire book. So I can't start high. If I know I'm bringing people down to this sort of depths that's in the text. So I don't know if you remember, Jenny, I started with a story of martyrs, 40 martyrs who refused to bow down and it cost them their life. I start with the story and the image and I give the background. That was all a bridge to be able to talk about Mordecai's refusal to bow down and how that was going to cost him and his people, right? It was just a bridge. But the mood of my introduction, like when you start talking about martyrdom and persecuted church and all, it's like, it's it's heavy. You're putting a a weight in the room. But it was intentional (laughs) because the text was heavy. So I wanted to bring people there and match the mood. So when you pick your sermon, think about the mood of your sermon. Is Jesus telling a parable? Is he telling a story? Is it instructive teaching from Paul, what's going on in the context, what's the mood, and then aim to bring in an introduction that sort of matches the mood of your sermon. Be prepared, be confident, and be in control. It's easy to stumble through an introduction. Effective preachers take the extra preparation necessary to avoid giving an introduction that feels choppy or uncertain. Again, think of it as the takeoff. We want to take off smoothly, and we want to bring people with us where we're going. And lastly, be yourself. Let your personality come through your introduction. People are going to relate to who you are more than what you say. Preachers obsess about wording and what it is we say. Just be yourself. Be who you are. Share your heart. Share what you're passionate about. Choose an introduction that sort of flows naturally from your own life experience. Any questions about the introduction? I'm going to fly through the rest because I want to get through it, okay? All right. Conclusion. Conclusion. Uh, You guys watch the gymnastics? You ever watch gymnastics? And you see, like, in the Olympics, they they, they, they run, and they, like, hit something, and they bounce, and they twist, and they go up, and then they need to stick the landing. Your conclusion is how you stick the landing. Okay. Um, my, one of my professors would say he, he had a guy who owned a restaurant and they would eat at the restaurant and the coffee was, oh, I can see myself on the screen there. I guess there's people on Zoom. There's one person on Zoom. Oh, hey, Oscar. So he's waving hi. Good to see you. Um, a professor who would talk about a, a guy who owned a restaurant and he had this a, a enormous investment in coffee. And I was a coffee lover. I love the investment in coffee anyway. But he invested in a, a lot of money in coffee in their coffee system and their filtration and their beans and their process, all these other things. And he asked him why. He said, why do you spend so much money and time and effort making sure your coffee is what it is? He said, because at the end of a meal, people get dessert and they get coffee. And the coffee is the taste they leave with. Your conclusion is the taste people leave with. In fact, they may not remember your points and what you said, but the last words of your sermon are likely to be the ones that stick. So I'll tell you this. I spend a lot of time on my introduction, and I spend a lot of time on my conclusion because I know this is what's going to help me bring people in, and this is sort of the final nail that's going to help me drive these points and this message home. 
Okay. Um, a few quotes there on conclusions. I give that to you. You can look through that. Um, avoid these common mistakes with a conclusion, okay? You don't want to introduce new points or extra ideas at the end, okay? It's like the plane that's near JFK, but they just keep circling. And, and everyone's sitting there thinking like, when's he going to land? When's she going to land, you know? And we're just circling. Don't introduce new ideas or points. This is your time to, to reinforce what you've already put out not to add something new on the table. Number two, don't just summarize the message. Not a bad idea, I often do it. Let me just, oh, you know, and so remember, this, and this, and this. But don't just summarize the points, invite people to act. So take this past week, only because it's fresh in my mind. Esther humbled herself before God. She identified herself with God and his people, and she uh, presented herself to God. She offered herself to God. I wanted to invite people to see themselves as an Esther type figure that we could offer ourselves to God as well. I think I quoted Romans 12, present yourselves, your bodies as living sacrifices. Esther is willing to offer herself as a dying sacrifice. I invoked this living sacrifice idea, sort of a little bit of a connection. But I really wanted people to see themselves as the possibility of Esther. So for my conclusion, I referenced Frodo again, but I took that intro a little layer deeper. Tolkien says he was the most unlikely creature imaginable. So he wasn't like a superhero. He wasn't a king. He wasn't this, you know. What I'm trying to say to people is you don't have to be like a pastor or an elder or a worship leader to live this out. It's for all of us. We're all Frodo's. We're all Esther's. We're all invited not to shrink back but to step up. So all I did there, I sort of, I like bringing in my introduction to my ending because I feel like that sometimes feels like a package for people. And then they see like, oh, this was all kind of saying the same thing and you're able to nail it home. So I always look for introductions and I'll leave a little detail out of an introduction and then bring it back at the end because it just ties everything up nicely. But really, you, don't, you want your introduction to be able to not just be a summary but an invitation for people to respond and to live out the ideas you presented. Don't announce that you're concluding. Okay? You don't even really want to announce. And my first point is, and my second point is, and my th don't announce what you're doing. Just do it. Take people with you. Take them on the journey. Show them that you're ending. Don't tell them that you're ending. Bring them to a conclusion point. And then don't blame the clock and rush to a conclusion. <laughs> some, some, what did you say? Yeah. The worst thing we could have done was go second. No, you're going to do great. You're going to do great. You're going to do great. Pastor Steve's got a lot of grace, you know? Um, it's great experience. Um, best practices to stick in the landing. Number one, bring it. Bring it full circle from your introduction if you can. Think about ways that you can tie up loose ends. That if, let me put it this way. If you raise a tension in the beginning, make sure it's resolved by the end. Okay? Don't create a problem or ask a question you're not going to solve through the text for your hearers. Your conclusion is your time to tie up any loose ends and drive in. Any nails that are sticking out, drive them in in your conclusion. Okay? Number two. End with emotional intensity. I think you want to end with people feeling your heart and your passion and your conviction that everything you said, you really believe. And you want to end with that sort of emotional intensity. And here's the reason. I think you want to end with a little bit of emotion generally. It's because you want to make sure the content moves from the head to the heart. This is why I like to bring the gospel in near the end of my sermon. Because if I can connect it to Jesus, and I can connect it to the gospel, and it's not about what we do, but what Christ has done for us, I'm now touching your heart. I'm now enabling you to see God's love for you and God's care for you, and all and these things as the ground for it. So, end with emotional intensity. Number three, make it personal. Number four, invite people to respond to God's word. I love this quote. John Stott says, if there's no summons... There's no sermon. We're not just 
preaching the Word of God. We're inviting people to live in light of the Word of God. Okay, now you can be as specific or non-specific as you want to be. I tend to be less specific in my invitations and my applications and things like that. I want to invite you to wrestle through with it on your own. But depending on philosophy, some of our preachers may be more specific than others. So here are three ways you can live this out in your life this week at work. Here's how you can live this out in your family. Here's how you can live this out in your community. Here are some three practices that you can embody this week to help you. It's a good time to do that if you, if you, if you choose to. And then, again, offer opportunities for people to receive Christ. Expect people to respond. So we want to begin well. We want to end well. It's the taste they leave with. And then lastly, I would say, and then I'll open up the questions, I want to invite you to consider flying uh, freely when you know the way. Uh, Jenny, where do you live? Westbury. And where are we now? Syosset. And what roads do you take to get from Westbury to Syosset? Yeah, you take the Northern State Parkway, and then you get off at South Oyster Bay Road, maybe. You turn left there, or right there, and you head up Jackson Ave, and then you, you know, make, you bear right on Cold Spring Road. Okay. Dan, Dan where do you live? Poor Washington. And where are we now? Sassy. And how'd you get here? Uh, Long Island Expressway. Took the Long Island Expressway. So you left Port Washington. What'd you, what'd you do first from your house? Uh, went south on um, Port Washington Boulevard. Mm-hmm. South on Port Washington Boulevard. And then what direction to, on Long Island Expressway? Yeah, east on the Long Island Expressway. Okay. Uh, 25 east. Yeah. So he, he heads. He starts. He knows where he's starting. You know where you're ending. And you know what roads you're taking along the way. When you're going somewhere you've never been or somewhere you don't know well, you need a GPS. And if you ever notice this, when you use your GPS, you never learn the way. <laughs> Do you ever notice that? I go to the same place time and time again. But if I never put down my, my phone, like I never actually learn the way. I'm just following the turn, the turn, the turn. And every time I go, I need to constantly be putting it in versus when you become familiar with the route. Now you know the way. I know where I'm starting. I know where I'm ending. And I know what turns I'm going to be taking along the path. That's how I think of preaching without notes. I know my introduction. I know my conclusion. I know the purpose. I know the, I know the route. I'm familiar with it. That I can just take people with me. Hop in. Hop in my car. We're going to head south first. And then we're going to head west. And then we're going to get off at this exit. And I'm going to put on my blinker so that I don't leave you behind. And you're going to come with me. You know? And I'm going to make another left turn. And then I'm going to bring you to a final destination. Preaching without notes is not impromptu preaching. It's not preaching on the fly. And it's not memorizing your sermon. It's not a play. Don't memorize your sermon. You're going to forget what you're saying. You're going to lose your spot. You're going to get nervous. You're going to get anxious. You're going to drop. You're going to be 10 minutes of silence. Preaching without notes is about diligent study throughout the week. I write out a full manuscript every sermon I preach. Full manuscript. 2,500 words, 3,000 words, something like that. Every single time I preach. I write out a full outline that has my structure. So I know my intro, my conclusion, my subpoints, my main idea, my illustrations, my transitions. I write everything out, I structure it, I've prepared, I've prayed over it, and then I go into the pulpit with nothing but my Bible and my brain. And that's preaching without notes. You spend so much time in it, which I know is going to be hard for you guys because you all have other jobs. This is my main job, so I get to do this, you know? But you spend so much time in it that you just know the way. So many advantages to preaching without notes, okay? Let me make the case. Preaching without notes makes your preaching more personal and conversational, okay? When was the last time you were at lunch with someone and instead of having a conversation with them, they were doing this and giving you notes? It's what you do in an interview. It's what you do in a, in a speech. It's not what you do relationally. So for me, I'm a relational person. I'm conversational. 
in general. And I want people to feel like when I'm standing up on Sunday or we're out on the golf course, Dan, like they're getting the same person. Like we're just talking, we're just talking about life and we're just unpacking some things and we're fleshing some things, whatever. Like it's just, it's just personal and relational and conversational. I think preaching should be conversational. This is a, one, something for me, I'll just say. When I go to hear a sermon, I feel like I'm being yelled at or, or lectured. Or it's, come on. Speak with me. Talk, let's, let's, let's converse. Let's have a, a dialogue here. Preaching without notes number two forces clarity. Okay? Forces clarity. Um, I, had a, I had a professor who would say, a fog in the, bul- in the pulpit is a mist in the pew. Okay? Fog in the pulpit is a mist in the pew. Okay? So you got to be clear. I know where I'm starting. I know where I'm ending. I know where I'm saying. I know where I'm going. Okay, you have your crystal clear to use the language of a few good men. Okay, number three, preaching without notes helps you be expository in your preaching. This is probably my strongest argument for preaching without notes. When you don't have physical notes that you're using, the Bible and the text become your outline. It forces you to make sure that your arguments are coming from the text. Okay, so I know I've got an introduction. I know what it is. I got the story. I'm going to bridge into the text. I'm going to set up a transition. I'm going to raise attention. I'm going to surface a need, whatever that is. And I'm going to get into my text. I'm going to read my text. And from the text, I'm going to extract some teaching points that I want people to hold on to or a main idea or two things or whatever they are. But they're coming from the text. And you'll notice when I preach, and I want to encourage you, whenever you preach, and you guys are talking about expository preaching a lot, right? Whenever you preach, tie in your teaching to the text. I don't care what you think. I I don't care about your opinion. I don't care about your thoughts. I want to know what you say is grounded in what God has said. So I'm always listening to, where are they getting that from? I don't see that here. It's not that it's not a good point. It's not that it's not insightful or inspirational or thoughtful or true. But if it's not here... Why are you telling it to me when you're preaching on this? What does this say? What does God say through his word? And how are you going to put it in language I can understand? So preaching without notes forces me to preach expository sermons because I've got to get my my points from the text. And I've got my Bible there. And I know my first teaching point is grounded in verse 3. My second one is grounded in verse 10. My third one is grounded in verse 15. And I'm going to walk through it. Let me show you. In verse 3, it says this. Let me show you how this relates to that. And, and you're dropping through. Okay? So forces you to, to really stay close to the text. Preaching without notes requires you to prepare well. I already talked about that. It takes, I, it takes a lot of preparation. It's easier to just write your sermon and read your sermon. It's a whole different thing to feel like it's in me. And it can't just help but come out. I got to tell you what I learned. I got to tell you what God's showing me. I got to tell you what the text says. I got, I got, I got to share it. I got to share it. I got to share it. But that takes time with the text. Um, yeah. A lot of intentionality. Number five, preaching without notes forces you to internalize your message and own it more deeply. It just seeps in and it can't help but flow out. Number six, Preaching without notes conveys authenticity and sincerity. I'm not saying you're not sincere when you look at your notes, but when you just are speaking to me directly, I feel like it's just coming through more authentically. Number seven, preaching without notes helps you maintain constant eye contact. We already talked about that. Preaching without notes helps you read the room. If you're losing people, you know it. You can see it. Start getting some head nods like I'm getting right now. You know, okay, I got them. They're with me. I can read the room. I see it. And you can adjust, you can adapt, you're flexible, you know, because you can see what's happening. And you can follow the Lord's leading in those moments. Because I'm not as concerned about every word and mastering it perfectly. More concerned about what God's doing in the moment, through the sermon, and the lives of the people. And I can sense that. Preaching without notes makes you more vulnerable. This is something I'm gro- trying to grow in, in my preaching is just being more vulnerable in my preaching. But I think preaching without notes makes you more vulnerable because you don't have the safety net. 
and security of, of this, or just looking down, you're a little more exposed. You're a little more out there. And um, I think that's a good thing because you just open yourself up to people to hear your heart through what God has shared with you this week. Preaching without notes combats perfectionism in preaching. Anybody have a perfectionistic tendency? I got to get every word right. No, you don't. No, you don't. Right? Paul says, and I put the scripture there for you at the bottom. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I often feel a pressure. I've got to wordsmith this. I've got to get this exactly right. I've got to make sure this is exactly what the text says. I've got to be able to defend this. I mean, the Bible says teachers will be judged more strictly. I don't know why you guys are teaching this preaching class. You know what I'm saying? You're about to be judged, about to be judged more strictly one day. But like, I, you take it very seriously and you feel this pressure of I've got to get it right. But there's a freedom that comes when it's like, you know what, Lord? I've done my work, I've studied the text, I've uncovered and unpacked what I think you want me to say to this people at this time, in this way, I'm ready. And now I've got my Bible, and I've got this word you've put in my heart, and I'm going to share it. And there is something very liberating about that, that's non-performance oriented. It just, you're trusting God. Every time I preach, I forget something I plan to say. Every time. Every time. Which is why I think you should always have more than one service in a church because you get a chance to do it again. Okay. Plus, I don't think you should work so hard on something and only get to deliver it once. You should at least get to deliver it twice. Maybe three times. Uh, but I, I forget something every time. But the good news is the congregation doesn't have my manuscript. I don't know. I don't realize I forgot something or I left something out. Every time I preach, I forget to say something I intended to say. And every time I preach... I say something I never planned to say. Every time. But that, and that doesn't happen right away. But I just say like, I love that freedom of like, something's going to come out and it, and it probably wasn't from me. So I think God works in the preparation for sure, but he also works in the moment. And so I want to give him space for that. Some tips for preaching without notes. Is, is anyone up for it? Anyone going to try it here? I'll tell you what. Give it a sh- I want to encourage you. Try this. This is the place to do it. Maybe not on the five-minute one, but on the 15-minute one. You know, practice that. Get your introduction. Get your conclusion. Think about your structure. Send me your outline if you want. We'll talk it through, you know? And uh, practice it, you know? And, and things like that. Prepare well. you you got to write yourself clear. This is really important. I write a full manuscript every week because... Without that, I don't have the clarity. It's not structured as logically. It doesn't flow as naturally. You know, like when you write, it's, write yourself clear. You write it out, clarity comes. Um, it, it forces you to hone your ideas. My, uh, Haddon Robinson would say, a sermon should not be a bullet, but a buckshot. I'm sorry, a sermon should be a bullet, not a buckshot. It should be a rifle shot, not a buckshot. A rifle shot is very small, very narrow. A buckshot expands, okay? Your aim in the sermon is narrow. So it forces you to have a very narrow focus. Here's my main thing or things I'm intending to say in the sermon. I've got a limited time. I've got a limited text. I can't say everything about everything. I'm going to say this well. But it forces you to give that kind of clarity and focus. It forces you to structure your sermon logically. Um, When you preach without notes, commit, commit your... Your main ideas and your movements to memory. That's the one thing I want to say. Is, it's not that you don't, memorize, you don't memorize anything. You might memorize one line. You might memorize your language around your key points. But that's easy to do, you know? When you're using the text and you're getting language that comes from the text. Leave what you forget behind. Trust that your preaching doesn't rest on your words, but on God's power. So, I think that's just about my time. I want to open up to any questions you guys may have, but the takeoff, the landing, spend time on it. Conclusion, you want to stick the landing, you want to land the plane. We don't just stop talking. We end with a conclusion. 
And let me just say something about a conclusion. Like a conclusion could be all sorts of things. Like, I mean, a um, story, a hymn, a quote. I was preaching on the Lord's Prayer, not my will, but your will. I started with a story of a Japanese soldier in World War II who didn't surrender. He didn't surrender for 45 years. His name was Hiro Onada. And I tell the story of how the Germans had surrendered and Japan had surrendered, but this person would not surrender for decades, hiding out in the woods in the 60s and 70s after the war had ended. You know about this? Yeah. Yes, of course. You can, you can teach us all about it. He's hiding out. He won't surrender. He refuses to surrender, to acknowledge that the war was over. He thought it was all allied propaganda that the war was over. And he kept fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And I tell the story. I say, I know that seems ridiculous. But we do the same thing with God. We refuse to surrender. We refuse to acknowledge that the battle's already been fought, the victory's already been won. We, we refuse to give him our absolute unconditional surrender. Today we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer and how God invites us to pray. Not my will, but your will. That's language of absolute unconditional surrender. That's an introduction. I'm gotten into the text. I've made a connection with myself and the passage. I'm going to teach through what does that mean? Not my will, but your will. But I remember that sermon. I ended with a quote from John Newton. I didn't go back to the, to the intro. John Newton, the guy from Amazing Grace, had a great quote. He said, um, um, man, I'm going to forget it now. Um, I'll find it. I'll find it for you when you get back, okay? He had this brilliant, beautiful quote that had to do with surrender. Not my will. Not what I will or when I want or how I want, but what you want. Or something like that. It was some, some beautiful, eloquent phrasing. And I closed with that. That's the language of absolute, unconditional surrender. Let's pray. And then I would pray a prayer like that for us. Lord, let us be a people that does this, that does that. You know, surrenders in that way. So you don't have to, you know, you can tie it in a different way with your conclusion, but... Anyway, I've talked too much. Introduction, takeoff, landing the plane, or sticking the landing, and then flying freely without notes. Can I? Shoot. Yeah. Um, can you give me an example, please, of introducing another, um, in, in the conclusion, you're introducing another idea. Yeah. Can you give me an example, please? Yeah. So... Um, let me think. Well, it's not something you want to do, <laughs> right? So we're talking about um, pride and how God opposes the proud. And maybe that's the main thing we're talking about mm -hmm. is pride. So subjects that relate to pride, you may pride or humility or whatever, right? But you may not want to get to the conclusion and say, and so, you know, love one another. Uh, in this way. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. I'm getting people to think about this particular subject. So you don't want to, you know, rabbit trails? Right. Maybe a pre preacher get on rabbit trails and they're off over here. And it's okay to get on a rabbit trail, but you got to get people, you got to get back on track. Okay. Otherwise, you just disorient people. Okay. I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. You know? Exactly. You're in a sermon in Esther, and all of a sudden he's in Job, and then he's in Exodus, and he's in Joel, and now he's in Matthew, mm -hmm. and he's in Lu And I'm like, I'm not really sure, like, we don't want to like, we don't want to take a turn and not, and not put on a blinker, all right? I mean, we don't, want to, we don't want to reroute. Imagine if you're flying from New York to L.A., you want to go in a straight line. You don't want to go up to here, to here, to here. You want to take the most efficient route. Yes. Have you guys talked about transitions yet? No. They're like the ligaments in your bones. Connect one bone to another, there's a ligament, I think. <laughs> uh, that's like a transition. And, you know, I often think of it like a blinker. I'm going to let people know that I'm getting off this exit and we're about to move in a different direction. Uh, yeah. What are, you talk, what, are you, what are you talking about today? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What, do you have an introduction? Yes. 
you're looking for an intro to your text. So what's your introduction? Introduction is about remembering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me think of a transition, okay? I would say something like, um, are you talking about your own memory or something you remember? We remember significant moments in our life. I remember when I was X amount of years old and this happened. I remember the day I got married. I remember the day my first child was born. And those key markers in our life are what create who we are today. I'm just talking, right? Okay, you're remembering this, you're remembering this, you remember this. Um, they form me into who I am. They don't just tell me about my past, they tell me about who I am in the present, and they sort of shape who God's making me to be in the future. Okay. Sometimes we forget who we are. It's a little bit of move, right? Sometimes we forget who we are or what God has done. And that can cause us to lose faith or whatever. Okay? I don't know. I'm trying to build a bridge for you. But, yeah. I don't know. I think for you, um, Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say, okay, here's a good transition for you. We tend to forget all the times, that all the things that God has done in our life. We forget his faithfulness in the past. We forget his provision in the past. We forget the ways come through in the past. We do it all the time. I do it in my own life. I remember one time I did it, another time I did it, another time I did it. We all do it. If we went around this room, I'm sure we'd see that we all have a tendency to forget what God has done. Well, we're not alone. We're not the only people who forget what God has done. In fact, the Bible is written and it has stories of people for generations who have forgotten what God has done. In our text today, we're going to look at a whole community of people who had experienced God's deliverance, but they had forgotten what God had done. I'm going to read the text for you and uh, let's read it together. Boom. So you've talked about how this is our world. And then you brought it to the biblical world. It's encouraging for us to know we're not alone. We're not the only ones who do this. Transition. Well, that's good. So it would be good to give um, your introduction before we introduce the, the scripture, the text? You can do it any way you want. Okay. Any way you want. There's no set formula. And I think like the sermons can take different shapes in terms of it. I tend to like to bring up an introduction first before because I want to give people a reason yeah a reason to listen to what God has to say I want to give them a reason let me give them a reason let me service the need there's this, this is gonna it's gonna impact their life in some way it's gonna connect them in some way it's gonna pique their interest in some way they're gonna whatever like I want to do something tell people eager to hear it yes sir what would you say is the overlap and the differences between preaching on a text and teaching, like in a Bible study setting, teaching the text. Is, is there a difference or you see them as equal? Uh, what would you say? I think preaching and teaching are two different things. I think sometimes teaching can move into preaching, and I think preaching some, often I mean, always has elements of teaching. But I see preaching and teaching as, as, two, different, as two different things. And um, so, so what would you say are the differences? I would say, um, I, I view preaching as, an, as a little bit of an art form. So Paul, when he's preaching, he considers his audience, he considers his context, he considers who he's speaking to and how he's going to say it. He's considering how he's going to start, how he's going to end. I see you have many gods over here. I see you're very religious. You even have one to an unknown God, starting as a point of contact, because he's speaking to pagan people, right? So he's considering that context, and he's thinking about how he's going to start where they are and bring them a bridge to who Jesus is. 
He's speaking, that's in Athens, he's on the Areopagus. He's speaking to a Jewish audience, he's starting somewhere else. Writer of Hebrews, who's a preacher, starts somewhere else. Okay? So I think in general, in preaching, you're thinking about all of these other elements in terms of how you're going to meet people where they are and bring them with you through the teaching. So there's a little bit more of an arc to it. There's a, there's a little bit more crafting rather than just, let me tell you what it means. This is the text, this is what it means. This is the text, this is what it means. This is the text, this is what it means. So I think preaching has to consider, pre preaching, I mean, pre preaching is, you, you got some people that, <laughs> so, some people are so eager, ready to learn. Others, they got dragged to church that morning. You know, some people are believers, some people are unbelievers. So the mixed audience, the points of contact, where people are, I think preaching requires exegeting not just let me put it this way teaching requires exegeting the text preaching requires exegeting the culture and your listeners and the text does that make sense is that a good distinction would you push back on that i give it enough to push back on it i don't mind no don't push back no no I, it's just that uh, uh, as you know I, i've been leading bible studies for many years yeah so i'm trying to understand what would be the difference like if i can leverage off of something that i i can already do I yeah i think your your bible study um you're gonna you have a tremendous advantage in being able to know and understand the meaning of the text but preaching i think has to do with packaging a little bit more it's, there's sort of the art and craft of presenting the material to a wide range of audience in a monologue, not a dialogue, not with questions and answers, not, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's very few places in culture where there's a monologue anymore. But preaching is still one of those places where it's people just listening to you. So I think it is, it requires some, develop, some practice, some development of skills that are a little unique than in a Bible study. So leading a small group, leading a Bible study, you know, it's, it's different than giving a, a lecture. Um, and, and giving a lecture is different than delivering a sermon. So, but I think you have a great place to start. You know. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, when you started preaching, sir, um, and learning to read without your notes, I mean, speak without your notes. Have you ever? got nervous to the point where <laughs> you forget your no you, you forget what you're saying and yeah. you may have to look down on their notes and then by just looking down you get so distracted <laughs> so you're now thrown into this place how do you deal with that learning to read without your notes what if you forget well I, I don't bring them up with me oh yeah because if i bring them up with me i'll look at them <laughs> i'll be too tempted <laughs> i'll forget what i'm saying i'll be like what did i write <laughs> I leave them, they're, they're not, they're nowhere. I don't print them. I write them on my computer, but I don't print them. Yeah. Because, because if you bring them up with you, even if you haven't tucked in your Bible, you know. And you don't have to be dogmatic either. Like if you want, you write a post-it or two in your Bible. Yeah. You have a quote you want to read. You want to get the language right. Write it down. It's okay. But in general, I would say get rid of this. That would be my advice. Get rid of this. Be able to walk and talk and look and contact and relate and all of that. And just let it, let it come out, you know? That's true. Yeah. That's true. This is a barrier, I think, to building a relationship. I would never, I would never invite you to my home and sit down like this with you. Right? Never do that. So that's what I would say. But it's, this is a great place to try it. You know? Experiment. Have fun with it. Pastor Steve does a great job with it. Yeah. All right, I think we're doing Q&A. We're done, yeah. So come on up, guys, to the section. Go get them. <laughs> Stick the landing. First <laughs> really super. Just to give you a warning there. Oscar, uh, you can hear me okay? There is no return. All right, you have any questions or anything you want to chat about? Yeah. Uh, but the uh, uh, major league difference between you being on the pulpit and, and, and talking about uh, uh, Sunday uh, uh, service and today. So I've had a huge 
Mm. Mm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, no problem.